I am here to introduce the first speaker, who is one of our brilliant evening news reporters and a researcher in Dr. Hayden's lab, Jeff Carroll. Um, and Jeff, no bias tonight when you report on this session. I don't know, I'm gonna take a picture of myself. This is my first rehearsal of this talk too, so I hope it goes well. And my kids are in the front row, so if it sounds like there's three-year-olds screaming, it's um, because there are. <laughs> um, so basically, the, the only thing this uh, blind guy has to offer you is my own story. So I, I know that um, it's a little weird and arrogant for me to sit up here and talk about myself for 20 minutes. And I assure you that I, I feel really weird about it, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it anyway. And, and so I, I hope what I say is not gratuitous or uh, unnecessarily emotive, but I hope that you get what I'm trying to say. Uh, so as you might guess from the title of the session, I'm here to speak today about my own relationship with Huntington disease. I grew up uh, also in a, uh, this is I, that was I. Uh, <laughs> I was going to use a laser pointer to point out my uh, tight rolled pants, but. Uh, so I grew up just outside of Seattle, and uh, I come from a large family. I have five siblings, uh, some of whom are here today near the front row. Growing up, we almost never heard the words Huntington disease. I certainly never consciously processed them. My parents were quite religious. That's for you, Beth. My parents were quite religious and received some comfort from their church that HD was something we didn't need to worry about. Uh, as a kid, certainty is kind of contagious, so I, I never thought about Huntington disease growing up. In hindsight, this is a surprising kind of ignorance. My maternal grandmother spent the large majority of my childhood in a nursing home, destined to spend 20 years in a terminal, non-communicative state. I have these vague memories of sort of young holiday visits to this bed that contained a sort of terrifying figure. It's uh, no wonder that my mother didn't sort of continue these visits as we grew up. Despite how impossible it seems in retrospect, I grew up in strict ignorance of HD, its mode of transmission, and the threat that my siblings and I were under. I was a uh, reasonably bright kid who uh, got bored really easily. I, uh, I left high school uh, early to go to a local college and sort of drifted in and out of interest for a few years. And in 1996, a friend and I, the uh, least impressive recruits of the American Army that year, uh, <laughs> that might be in the nightly news. Uh, that's my wife, Megan, sorry, that's off. But uh, anyway, so we joined the Army to, uh, mm, my cues are off, that's sort of giving away all my story. Um, we joined the Army to kind of try and have an adventure, and I think we were both hoping that we could outsource growing up and that the Army would do it for us. So. Uh, in 1998, uh, I had been stationed in Europe and got married to my beautiful Canadian girlfriend, Megan, who is uh, also here today. We were having a great time exploring Europe, uh, but during late 1998, I was concerned about tensions mounting in Kosovo, not far away. That would be the cue. No. I had PBS slides and everything. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, not far away, so I came home for Christmas leave that year uh, knowing that conflict was likely looming. So I wasn't sure what was going to happen to me, but I was feeling a little apocalyptic. And it was during this visit home that my father told Megan and I about the reality of HD in my family. My mother, Cindy, who was not in the Kosovo Liberation Army. <laughs> Can I get the next slide from Sony and the computer? There we go. My mom, Cindy, uh, was not only at risk for HD, she was showing signs of the disease at the age of 46 sort of abstract fear of another war in the Balkans was replaced by this kind of primitive dread of what I had just learned. The nightmarish figure of my grandmother was not just some abstract thing, but it was now a very real um, potential. So nothing constructive happened that year with regards to HD. I went back to Europe after my leave and got distracted by the slide to war. I was trying to wrap my head around what HD meant while uh, practicing with my unit, breaching a mock-up of the Macedonian-Serbian border in Germany. Eventually, uh, bombs prevailed. There would be a slide that would look like a bomb. <laughs> and we went back to the field to learn how to be peacekeepers. I wasn't sure at the time what that meant, but I found out when I finally got to Kosovo in uh, October 1999. It meant long stretches of incredible boredom interspersed with very surreal moments. I had lots of time to think, and I decided to learn about HD. 
I was frustrated with the uh, depth of information that I could find. I felt sort of patronized, and I had this huge hunger to understand what was happening. When I returned to Germany in July of 2000, I took a biology course, sort of desperate to learn the language that I felt I would need to understand what was happening. This uh, is a fun interlude. This is a picture I took in uh, 1999 in Kosovo of an event I was attending at uh, Camp Monteith. And the uh, tall fellow standing up on the box in the far back right of the thing is an NBC uh, reporter named Charles Sabine, who I <laughs> had no idea who he was at the time. <laughs> I don't even think he'd heard of HD yet, but it's a small world. <clears throat> my military service was over, and uh, my wife and I returned to Vancouver, her hometown, in uh, March 2001. So in case anybody's keeping track, that was a really good time to get out of the American military. I took a job, but I registered at the University of British Columbia. I was admitted as a philosophy student because my bizarre academic history failed to impress the biology department. <laughs> so I decided to talk my way into first year science program. Uh, if nothing else, the army had taught me how to manipulate bureaucracy to achieve my goals. Uh, and army discipline saved me that first year as 18 year old kids with prerequisites taught me what it's like to feel completely stupid. In my second year, I got a job in the lab with one of my professors and started learning that science is a process, a way of thinking about the world, and not some set of experiment or facts to memorize. It was during this period that I decided to get tested for HD. I'd always known I wanted to be tested, but it took time to become a priority. I knew that a famous researcher, Dr. Michael Hayden, <laughs> I wanted to see his face when I did that. that that's how we work. Dr. Hayden worked in Vancouver and helped pioneer access to predictive testing. In the fall of 2003, during the second year of my university, I received a positive test result for HD, 42 CAGs. I told the physician who delivered the news, Paul Goldberg, that I wanted to help, or as my wife says, I asked for a job. <laughs> Paul arranged for me to meet Dr. Hayden in late 2003. I was extremely nervous to come see this important HD lab and meet this prominent HD researcher. Michael was fantastic and invited me to attend a lab event and meet with him after. I knew something was different when I realized the first lab event I attended was a play Michael had commissioned about testing an HD. He said a pretty remarkable thing to me during our personal meeting afterwards. He said, you know, you don't have to do this. You're a complete person and HD does not have to run your life. You can do anything you like. But I was hooked. I don't know if it's just me, but I'm much less scared of things I understand. A big part of my fear of HD was not just the disease itself, but the ignorance surrounding the disease. Michael's lab was a place where really smart people got together every day and tried to cure this disease. It wasn't going to be easy to get rid of me. Michael offered to let me join his lab as an undergraduate assistant so I could get involved without having to make an open-ended commitment. In retrospect, this was a brave thing to do. If I truly am a whole person with all of life's options open to me, I should be able to dedicate my life to anything I want, including working on HD. This was a risk for him and the lab, but he never made me feel uneasy or awkward about it. Since coming to the lab in January 2004, I've never looked back. I transitioned to a PhD that fall, and I'm in the process of completing my thesis, maybe, uh, right now. <laughs> I began feeling lucky just to be led in the door. Michael's group is among the world's top HD labs. Thanks to the remarkable trust he has had in my abilities, I've been tested. I've discovered that I can contribute something to this cause. I've been involved with the cutting edge of HD research and have com come to feel comfortable there, which is a real gift. Also, I have a backup career as a reporter if that doesn't work out. <laughs> there have been unexpected twists and turns during my journey in the lab. In 2005, my granddad, the uh, finest man I have ever known, became uh, ill after over 80 years of rude health. I have to explain that my granddad is my hero. He was a great inspiration to me. In hospital, I sat with him and told him that I wanted him to be around to meet my kids. He told me nothing would make him happier, but that he'd had a good run and he had no complaints. On reflection, this made me question what my wife and I were waiting for. Shouldn't we, of all people, know that life is short? As a researcher, I was acutely aware of the risks of HD. I was also determined not to pass a mutation on to future generations. During my genetic testing, the counselor had asked Megan and I if we were thinking about having kids, and I said no, and then realized that was my answer, and we hadn't actually talked about what HD meant for kids at all. But I felt very strongly that I didn't want to pass on this mutation. 
We are very lucky to be among the first generation of people for whom this was at least possible thanks to a procedure known as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, or PGD. After talking it over with Megan, I found that there was a clinic in Vancouver which had recently started uh, doing the first commercial PGD services in the city. They knew of HD but had not had a successful pregnancy. We decided to give it a shot. PGD is not easy, especially for women. As anyone with knowledge of in vitro fertilization can tell you, the procedure is uncomfortable and sometimes painful. It takes a strong partnership to withhold, uh, to withstand this kind of pain for your spouse's problem. I learned a lot about my wife during this time. She's a remarkable woman. As for me, I mostly stood around uselessly, as men tend to do. <laughs> On December 5th, 2005, we had an ultrasound that confirmed that Megan was carrying not one, but two babies who would never be affected by Huntington disease. HD is done killing people in my family when I am gone. Thanks to the work. I think that was for you, actually, Megan. Thanks to the work of the scientific heroes who cloned this gene, as well as developing the techniques that allow for successful screening, Billy and Elijah will never have to live under the shadow of HD. They're also in the front row if the pictures get boring. <laughs> I believe that this is a stunning testament to the power of knowledge and of scientific research. But life goes on. While PGD is a blessing for those in a position to use it, it's not a cure for those living with the disease now. Shortly after my babies were born, my mother's HD took an acute turn for the worse and she died in December of 2006. The night she died, her movements were uncontrollable, but as we left the room, I put Elijah to her neck. She became quite still. For what was probably less than a minute, but felt like an hour, she didn't move as this tiny baby rested on her shoulder. My mom loved babies, and I'm glad that she got to meet mine but she deserved to have watched them grow. So we have work to do. As a family member, as well as a scientist, I've been fortunate to witness the accelerating push towards therapy over the last five years. Since cloning the gene in 93, scientists have produced a number of models of HD from yeast to sheep. I met a scientist here that is developing a pig model of HD. They're squeezing these model systems for insights into what molecules are involved in HD as hard as they know how. As has so often been the case in HD research, academic researchers with nothing to gain are moving mountains to identify potential drug targets for HD. Something else has changed over the last five years. An innovative nonprofit organization known as CHDI has changed the landscape of how targets are prosecuted. Roby Blumenstein, Robert Pacifici, Alan Tobin, and Ethan Signer have built up a remarkable group of researchers. These guys go to work every day with a single express goal to rapidly discover and develop drugs that will slow or delay Huntington disease. So as family members, we are doubly lucky. First, to have been blessed with researchers who worked so hard for so long when no one else cared about us. And now, this unique partnership is emerging between those researchers and an organization with the skills and resources to turn drug targets into drugs lest you get the impression that I live in a constant state of optimistic excitement, I'll tell you that my involvement with research has at times been humbling. The thing that surprised me at first is how infrequently things work. As I've sort of matured as a scientist, I've realized the successful stories we publish are the exception rather than the rule. Science is mostly comprised of figuring out what doesn't work so we can focus on the small set of things that do. At times I've heard concerns from members of the HD community that science isn't moving fast enough. I share your sense of urgency, but with one foot in each camp, I can tell you that this urgency is universal. It's only taking so long because what we're trying to do is so terribly hard. As someone with a personal stake in the outcome, it would be easy to get discouraged. Despite the remarkable nature of individuals who are working on this, it is a human endeavor with all of the complications and limitations this implies. But on reflection, all I can feel is a profound sense of gratitude. We are, all of us, lucky to be born in an era in which hope in the face of this disease is anything but an empty dream. <laughs> he wants to come on stage. <laughs> Having explained who I am and how I got here, I want to finish today by addressing the topic of this session. What is the role of HD families in research? The answer to this question depends on each family's resources, so I have no answers, but I do have some ideas. In the most direct way, we can become involved. Mothers with smart kids, and I'm looking at you, Cheryl Largy, or I would be if I could see you. Don't be scared to talk about research as a noble career ambition. I personally know several scientists working on HD who are themselves at risk. 
but personally conducting research is not for everyone. Given the pay and the hours, I'm sometimes amazed we keep the lab full at all. So outside directly conducting research, there's an enormous amount of room for direct family member involvement. The history of HD family member advocacy is full of inspiring figures. Ralph and Ariel Walker, Marjorie Guthrie, Milton, Alice, and Nancy Wexler, so many others have taught us that HD is not a shameful family secret, but a disease whose patients deserve compassionate care and a fight worthy of hope. I don't mean to sound patronizing. I know many people in this audience have given enormous amounts to this cause, in some cases since before I was born. But websites need to get made, money needs to be raised, deals need to be negotiated, hands need to be held. We can all find a way to help. Beyond directly facilitating science and patient care, we are desperately needed as subjects in observational studies. Two trials, PREDICT HD and TRACK HD, are currently underway. In both cases, critical input is needed from the whole HD community. Those who've tested positive and those who've tested negative as well. Only our mutation negative brothers and sisters can uh, serve as controls in these experiments. I'm very proud of my sister Stacy and Beth, who've undergone MRIs, hours of questions, and even spinal taps for the sake of a disease that will never affect them. I've seen findings from these studies presented by scientists, and many have already been published. You've seen some here this week. These data are necessary for planning clinical trials with any hope of success. Correctly determining if a drug cures HD depends critically on careful measurement. Deciding what to measure and getting these measurements correct now means that when we do it for real, the trials will provide useful information. I can't imagine a worse outcome than a drug that really does help HD that we ignore because our clinical outcomes are not accurate enough. Our clinician friends know this and are working to avoid it. We, as family members, need to meet them halfway by showing up and doing whatever ridiculous task they asked us to do over and over and over again. And I say that as someone who's just finished my sixth Predict HD visit, which makes me feel old. Scientists and uh, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies are interested in this data because it shows that running HD trials will provide useful answers. Testing neurodegenerative diseases drugs is notoriously difficult, which is one of the reasons there are so few drugs from these, for these common diseases. We've heard over and over again at this meeting for the hunt, about the hunt for a biomarker that can uh, indicate HD's progression. That's what these studies are all about. I've heard from relatives and others in the HD community that drug companies don't care about us because there are not enough patients to make a profit. I don't know if this is ever true, but I can tell you it's not true now. Just look at the participant list for this meeting. Scientists are here from Pfizer, Medivation, Novartis, Genzyme, Neurosearch, Vertex, Isis, many other companies. They're here because they're betting that drugs for HD are possible. One of the reasons drugs are possible is the hard work required to properly measure HD symptoms has and is being done. Which brings me to the subject of clinical trials. Clinical trials are happening now and seem likely to increase. You have to be 18. <laughs> Each clinical trial requires a large number of gene-positive symptomatic individuals. The recently completed trial of ethyl EPA involved 300 individuals. Huntington study groups phase three coenzyme Q10 studies enrolling over 600. Anecdotally, recruitment for these trials has not been as rapid as we would hope. Looking at the ACR16 trial being run by Neurosearch is interesting. Neurosearch is currently recruiting approximately 220 people across North America to test their drug. To stay on schedule, the last person signing up for the trial had to have had their first visit by November 24th this year. This schedule would have required 26 patients a month to sign up for the trial. In reality, over the last six months, they've recruited an average of 16 patients per month. This shortfall means the results of this trial will be delayed, if trends continue, by about three months. If ACR16 turned out to be the wonder drug that profoundly changed the course of HD, we all would have just lost three months worth of neurons waiting for recruitment. I have no idea if ACR16 is a wonder drug or not, but I would rather know and move on. I encourage the lay and funding organizations to work together towards a, bet, towards a unified communications pipeline about clinical trial progress. We as family members need to meet these organizations halfway by being reachable and in touch. Everyone in this room who is eligible for clinical trials or knows somebody who is should register at hdtrials.org. My hope is that some of the initiatives discussed at this meeting will lead to a better flow of information on clinical trials from sponsors and initiators to patients. Finally, I'd like to say a few words about genetic testing. What may not be obvious to everyone is that all the trials I've mentioned can en only enroll mutation positive or symptomatic people. Ethically, giving experimental compounds to unaffected individuals is impossible, severely limiting the pool of potential participants in trials. 
I know this is a contentious issue. I don't have the answers for anyone but myself. But historically, many people have preferred not to know their status because in the absence of treatment, there seemed to be no benefit to knowing. But having my test result has immensely improved my life in concrete ways despite carrying the mutant gene. I was able to make reproductive decisions that ended HD in my family. I was able to pick a career that was meaningful in the context of a foreshortened lifespan. I am able to further to contribute to the therapy by participating in trials that are only open to tested individuals. The uptake rate for genetic testing HD varies worldwide between 5 and 20 percent, probably something like 10 percent in North America. Reasonable approximations argue that there are about 50,000 people in North America between the ages of 18 and 45 carrying the HD mutation. These are the people who could eventually participate and benefit from clinical trials. If we accept these approximations and assume a, a testing uptake rate of about 10 percent, we would guess there are about 5,000 people who could currently participate in clinical trials in North America. But not all these people can participate in every trial. As many of you will know, each trial comes with a long list of things like age, CAG size, other medications, and other things that eliminate a number of people from the testing pool. Furthermore, geographical sites are not equally distributed around the world, meaning that not everyone can participate in every test. Currently, these trials are being run on only on symptomatic people. My sincere hope is that we are moving towards an era when we start running preventative trials based on biomarkers discovered and track and predict. This is not opinion or advocacy, but a simple fact. To cure HD, we need to run clinical trials. In order to run clinical trials, we need as deep and as broad a subject population as possible. Only as a community can we run the trials that are needed to cure HD for ourselves, our children, and our grandchildren. For the people who've decided that testing is the right thing to do for themselves, participation in trials is a concrete benefit for themselves and for all of us as a community. I have often thought that the unique evil of HD is its utter lack of hope. So many other human diseases, uh, no matter how devastating, offer some small portion of hope. The finality of genetic judgment in HD is to me its cruelest feature. But my interaction with scientific research over the last six years is changing these feelings of hopelessness. My blind fear of my grandmother's shape in her bed has been transformed into the more mundane fear of something that is dangerous but understood. My refusal to consider having children has been transformed by science into two beautiful little people who have every reason to expect a long life. And my feeling that there is no hope has evolved into a belief, into a belief that the people living with HD today have every reason to hope for a treatment and to fight for that hope. Thank you.